All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this week's Autonomy Talks. This week is a great pleasure to have with us Steve, Professor Stephen Smith, who is an associate professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Waterloo in Canada, uh, where he holds a Canada Research Chair in Autonomous Systems. So something about Stephen, he received a Bachelor of Science degree from Queen's University and his Master of Science degree uh, from the University of Toronto. He then moved to some better weather to California to get his PhD degree from the University of California, Berkeley, uh, sorry, California, Santa Barbara, working with uh, Francesco Bullo. And he also then uh, spent some time at MIT for his postdoc at the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. Uh, his main research interests lie in control and optimization for autonomous systems with a particular emphasis on robotic motion planning and coordination. And for his work, he won uh, a number of uh, awards that you can see in the bio. Today's talk is about learning motion plans and user preferences for robot autonomy. And we are all very interested in learning more about this topic. So without further ado, I, I give you the stage, Stephen. Great, yeah. Th thanks a lot for the intro and uh, thanks for having me as part of the seminar series. Um, yeah, so I guess what I want to talk to you about is kind of two, two related topics in uh, motion planning um, for you know robot autonomy, and so the first one. Well, I, I guess let me let me motivate it a little bit. So I mean, I think as we all know, robots are are moving from these more walled off environments where they're operating separate from humans, um, you know, uh, safety by separation essentially, to these more collaborative scenarios where robots are working with humans around humans um, and have to kind of uh, accommodate them in their planning. And so when we move to these more human-centric environments, there's now two aspects to robot performance. There's the sort of hard aspects, which we can think of as uh, the, the completion time to, for a task, um, maybe things like you know metrics, like do they get in, into a collision or not? Um, What's the energy usage of the team? I don't know, Dif different metrics like this. And so typically we can write this as optimizing some cost function, right? The other one is a sort of softer aspect. And it's like, how acceptable is the behavior to the humans that are around that robot? Um, and so this could be things like, does the robot give me enough space as a person? And as, as you might imagine, this is dependent on the particular person and what they're comfortable with. Um, maybe does it avoid areas that I think are undesirable for the robot to operate in? Does it travel in a predictable manner around me uh, to make me feel comfortable? Things like that. And so these second set of aspects are dependent on the particular user or the context or the people around the robot. And that can make it more challenging to try and optimize these types of objectives with just stating a specific cost function. So in terms of the first category where we're thinking of optimizing a cost function, when we move to these less structured environments, there's of course some uncertainty. Um, and so the, the application that I'm going to talk about in this talk is where robots are repeatedly performing some tasks. So it could be, for example, on the right-hand side here, there's uh, material transport tasks in a like warehouse type environment where you know it's robots acting kind of as forklifts for pallets. Um, and maybe there are also people operating in this environment and, and other workers. And so there is some uncertainty in, in what's free space and what's uh, wh where there might be occupied space. And so you would like to then, in these settings, try to learn something about the structure of the environment, this uncertain environment, to improve performance over time. And then the second one is that when we go to try to learn user preferences, one, one way you could think of learning them is just ask the person, right? Like, how much space do you want the robot to give you? But the thing that we find is that users have difficulty actually specifying what they want. They know it when they see it, but they don't necessarily have the ability to like clearly write it down as a set of constraints for a robot to solve, you know, in an optimization problem. And so, um, they also typically have difficulty understanding how what they would specify would impact the way the robot performs in, in that first set of metrics. And so our objective here is to try and learn the user preferences through kind of simple interactions to try and essentially learn a cost function that we then can optimize. 
And so we call this active preference learning. Um, and this is kind of one example that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about where you have you know, a robot and it's performing some task of picking up an object on the left-hand side and bring it to the right-hand side. And different users might have different preferences on how this robot performs this kind of task. Um, so these are just like two areas. In, in my lab, we've been working on a fair number of things. Um, and so I just picked kind of two that I thought were interesting for this, this seminar. But um, we're also doing some work on um, uh, scene reconstruction using aerial vehicles on kind of human-centric motion planning uh, with multiple robots, uh, local motion planners for autonomous driving, uh, some work in precision agriculture and soil sampling and also pesticide application. Um, this is kind of uh, this idea of, again, a kind of motion planning problem in, in autonomous driving. And then we also have a kind of a neat project with uh, the National Research Council of Canada on uh, planning motion for autonomous boats in icy waters, which is a very Canadian uh, application, but a kind of fun one to think about because very briefly, you, you can't really avoid ice. Typically, you have like these ice breakers that tra travel through a channel and break up the ice. And now you have a smaller ship that's traveling through the icy waters. And so it's, instead of like trying to miss all the ice, you're trying to not hit ice you shouldn't hit, like big chunks that might damage the ship, while kind of pushing aside the smaller pieces that, you know, are are fine to push aside. And so it's a it's quite a you're kind of manipulating the environment in a sense as you're traveling through it, which makes it kind of interesting and as a planning problem. Anyway, okay, so the content for this talk is the first part on learning to navigate in uncertain environments. And then the second part is this learning user preferences. So let's start with the first part. Um, and I'll kind of build up some complexity in this. So we'll start off with like the simplest version of this problem, which is fairly structured. Um, but we call it the reactive planning problem. So you have a start goal task and you have a base map of the environment, which you can just think of as a graph. So you have a start node and a goal node on the graph. And maybe there are some additional obstacles in the environment. So here I'm just kind of showing a, like a, a picture of this. But maybe what you know about the environment is, let's say you're trying, I haven't actually shown the graph yet, but you're trying to travel from this start node to this goal here. And you know something like, if the obstacle O1 is present, then O2 is not. And if the obstacle O2 is present, then O1 is not. So, you know, some like conditional kind of uh, dependency on, on obstacles in the environment. And so you can imagine if you go and you, you, this is the faster way to get to the goal. But if you sense this obstacle O2 and it is present, then you have to take this long way around, right? And go through the other kind of door to get to the goal. And so an alternative could be, okay, I don't know which door is open. Maybe I would just take the conservative route, which is like go all the way around the bottom and back up. That will work no matter which environment I'm in. And maybe it's shorter than, than this one, not so clear from the picture I've drawn, but maybe it's shorter than this one, but it's longer than the kind of direct route. And so you have these trade-offs, right? It's like, do I try, do I kind of gamble and see if I can get through the door O2, and if not, I get a longer, a higher cost, or do I try and take the, you know, the surefire route that will definitely get me to the goal? This is kind of the, the idea of, of this type of reactive planning problem. So more specifically, we have a graph, which represents the, you know, it's a roadmap for the, for the robot motion, has costs on the edges, C, and you have a set of observations at each vertex. So you can think of these as like when you're located at a vertex, here it's just showing a simple grid graph. It tells you what, what edges, what transitions can I observe from that given vertex. So maybe you can observe all the outgoing edges from that vertex and tell if they're blocked or not in this particular environment that you're operating in. And then you have a cost for taking an observation. So you know, here's one example where you might take a, a measurement and you observe that this particular edge is blocked in the environment. And there's lots of different sensing models we can use for this in, uh, like in such an environment. You could think that 
a robot, it can make a decision to just sense a single edge going to another you know, location in the environment. Maybe it can sense all the outgoing edges or the neighbors of a given vertex, or it might have a model where you can view everything within line of sight of, of the robot. And in this uh, first problem, the reactive planning problem, you have a finite set of possible environment configurations. So these are, this is showing, let's say, three different environment configurations. The robot, when it starts, it doesn't know which one it's in, but it knows that it's in one of these three, basically. And it's trying to navigate from the start to the goal. And it knows a probability distribution over these environments. And so like at each time it tries to perform a task, an environment gets randomly drawn from the distribution and it starts operating and then tries to minimize the time to get to the goal. So in this kind of environment, the, the robot state can be thought of as like, where is it in the environment, its location, and then a set of environments that match its observations. So in this example on the right, you can see that, let's say the robot senses this particular edge traveling from where the robot is to the, the cell above it. If it sees that that edge is obstructed, it can't travel there, then it knows it must be in either the first or the second environment, right? I mean, there was three on the previous slide that I showed you. These are the, now it partitions those three. If instead it views it, views it unobstructed, then it, then it knows it must be actually be in that third environment that I showed. So every time you take an observation, it kind of, it partitions the space of possible environments into two subsets, ones that match and ones that don't match. And so then a policy for the robot is going to tell it, like, it's going to be, tell you where to move to next, what to observe, and then what to do for each possible outcome of the observation that you obtain. And we, we say that a policy is complete if it always either reaches the goal or determines that the goal cannot be reached in the environment that it's in. And your goal is to basically try and so maybe just given, given the information of the base map, a set of possible environment configurations with the probabilities, a start and a goal, find a complete policy that minimizes the expected cost. So this would be minimize the expected time until either you can declare that there's no path to goal or until you reach the goal, depending on the particular environment you're in. Um, as you might expect, this problem is, is an MP hard problem. Um, and so solving it exactly for larger instances is not really tractable. Um, and we look at kind of coming up with, a, with heuristics that, that seem to perform well. And so the idea behind it is when, when a robot's located at a given vertex, you could think of like, what are all the reachable observations from that vertex? So here's a picture. Let's say the robot is at this vertex here. It's like, where can I travel to before I reach an edge in the graph that I'm uncertain of its state? I don't know whether it's blocked or unblocked. And that kind of defines a front of, of some sort in this space, you know, where, where my information ends. And then you can think of when I take an observation, what do I, how will it change my belief over the environments? That's, that's this why here, right? Which, which environments match my observations and which ones do not. And so this conditional entropy defines basically the quality of an observation. And so if you think about going to take one of these particular observations, that's going to like reduce this, the set of environments that match your, uh, your observations, then you basically have a cost to travel to that. You have the reduction in entropy the conditional entropy of the environments given that observation. And then you're going to have, how much do I expect it to cost me to go from there to the goal? And that will depend on the information that I obtain at, at that observation. So the idea then looks something like this. So when you're deciding what, what observation to take next, you look over all those observations that are kind of reachable from where you currently are, the current vertex V. And you, you look at what's the cost to go get that observation. 
what's the cost of taking that observation? That could be zero, or it might be some non-zero quantity, depending on the kind of sensor. And then you have this kind of like, what's the expected cost to go, given that I obtained the information, right? I found out whether that edge was blocked or not. And this is multiplied by the conditional entropy of, you know, over my belief, given those observations. And so using this kind of rule, you can actually, con you can construct a policy that basically fully describes the, how the robot should move in the environment. It's, you know, it, it's a tree uh, and it has branches. So the vertices of the, the policy are observations. And then the branches show the possible outcomes of that observation. And then like, you know, each one has corresponding to it, the environments that still match the observations I've obtained to that point. And then, um, and then edges in this policy are motions between those observations. And so the runtime to compute this kind of policy scales as something like the number of environments times the size of the graph. And we can implement this on um, fairly like complex environments. So this is an example of a, of a graph. There's a start located in the top right, and then there's a few different goals, A and B. And there, there are a bunch of different regions that are highlighted in red, and they have different correlations, like things like if there's an obstacle located in one of these environments, then it's, or in one of these regions, then it's more likely that there's an obstacle in another one of the regions, things like that. The result is that you have a graph that has 48 vertices, 150 edges, and 35,000 approximately different environment configurations. And so now the robot's trying to navigate in this environment. And we compare it to like a few different uh, benchmark algorithms. One is just A star with replanning. Another one where you try to basically maximize the probability of success. And then uh, an, an, a paper that's kind of related to what was called the Canadian travelers problem, actually, which is called planning with recourse. Um, and so we, can, we get significant improvement over these existing methods. Uh, and our policy runs and uh, it can be computed for quite large environments. So now I guess the question though, then you, you probably what you, you could be wondering is, if it's a fairly strong assumption to think that these environments are known. Basically like you have to hand to the robot a set of 35,000 possible environments and a probability distribution over those environments. There's not so many settings or there's a lot of settings where you're not going to be able to do that. And so then the next step in this is what we call the learned reactive planning problem. So in this version, you basically take away all that prior information. All the robot is given now is a roadmap. So it could look something like this. You're trying to get from the start to the goal. And these are the set of all the edges and the vertices. Some of these edges might be blocked in a particular execution, right? Um, you have the start and the goal, and you have a number of times that you want to perform the start goal task. And unknown, but what's unknown is in each task, some of the edges are blocked. And so now what you want to do is find a sequence of policies that minimizes the total expected cost of executing these tasks. So the thing that, that's kind of like interesting or challenging in, in the way that this problem is stated is that there's, you don't give the robot any time to just learn the environment. Like you could imagine a different formulation of this, where it's like you get T1 uh, task executions where you get to do learning. And now you get T2 task executions where you kind of get scored on how well you perform. But in this, it's all mixed, right? You just have a total of T executions. At time zero, you know nothing. And your goal is to minimize the expected cost over those T tasks. So in any given task, you kind of have two objectives. One is to figure out something about the environment you're operating in. And the other is, of course, to just minimize the expected cost from start to goal. Learning about the environment might help you in future tasks, but it's going to hurt your performance in this particular task, probably. Whereas just exploiting the information and getting directly from start to goal, it might be a little bit myopic you know, and, and, and not help you in the future. So. 
in a graph that has E edges, there's two to the power of E possible subgraphs that the robot could be in, operating in. And basically, we just think that in each task, the robot, uh, you know, are some random subgraph is drawn from the environment or from this space of two to the E possible subgraphs, and the robot's operating in that one. And the, the, the these random variables that like index the the uh, the graph that you're given at each time instant or at each task, they're they have some unknown distribution right to the robot. So as an example, you know this could be the base graph, and then the next task you get you're dealt this graph, but you don't know it until you start moving in it and observing edges. The next task you're dealt this particular graph, something like this. This problem is uh, p space hard. And you can sh you can show it through a like a reduction from uh, a problem, uh, basically a variant of what's called the Canadian Traveler's problem. Uh, and there are some related works in in this area. One is is work on what's called the Canadian Traveler's problem. I think that then the origin of the name of this problem was like you're driving on snowy roads in the winter. And you don't know whether or not a road's going to be closed due to like the blizzard or, or the snowstorm until you get to like the beginning of that road. And so you're trying to, and it's kind of, I, it, it was initially stated as like a two player game. So the, the driver's trying to get home and the weather's trying to like make it as hard as possible for them to get home, essentially by closing, there's only certain roads that they can close due to weather, but they're trying to close the worst possible combination of them for you to get to the to your destination. Um, there's also been work on what factor grasp based approaches where you can try and learn something about the correlation between different edges in this environment. Uh, in, in this particular approach, it's limited to pairwise correlation between edges. So you can learn something like if this edge is blocked, then it's more likely that this other edge in the graph will be blocked. And then there's what we call like optimistic approaches, uh, like D star light, LPA star. They don't really attempt to learn the structure, but they just try to replan in the event that their current path doesn't work. So a little bit more about this idea of optimistic or pessimistic is what do you do when you don't know the environment. So like this is a super simple example, but the robot's trying to get from here to this goal. And you know maybe there's, there's this particular area that it doesn't know whether it's going to be blocked or not. If you're a pessimist, you don't try and even sense that particular part of the environment and you just take the long way around like this, right? And if you, you missed out, if, if there wasn't an obstacle present, but you were right if there was an obstacle present, right? On the other hand, if you're an optimist, you say, ah, it's probably not there. And you just try to go assuming that the obstacle is not there, right? And, and the optimist wins when there's no, no obstacle. And they lose, of course, when there is an obstacle. They take an even longer path. But the one advantage to the optimist is that they also learned something. Right? The pessimist didn't even get to see whether or not the obstacle was there. They just assumed it was there and went along with their, you know, their worst case assumption. The optimist got to find out. And that can be helpful, at least in the learning aspect of this kind of problem. So basically, the solution, the structure of the solution that we look at is when the robot travels from start to goal, it observes some edges as either blocked or unblocked. And some edges it doesn't observe at all, right? Like they're just in another part of the graph that it didn't travel to. So it, it, it begins, it tries to follow a policy. Either the policy works or it doesn't work because maybe it has, it, you know, the environment that it's operating in doesn't match any experience that the robots had before. In that case, it calls, if it doesn't work, it calls a reactive algorithm, which is basically an optimistic algorithm for planning the rest of the way to the goal. It gets to observe some more edges. From that, it gets like a new map of the environment. And then based on that new map, it can kind of update its policy and continue. And so the, the one question is, how do we store these maps used to estimate the correlations in the environment? And the idea that we have is to store, um, when we store maps, right? You can think about how, like, 
since there are some edges you don't observe, it's difficult to know, or you, you actually can't know, whether or not two maps came from the same environment or not. Because you might have observed different parts of the environment in each case, and you don't know that you know that they match on the parts that you saw, but you don't know whether or not they matched on the parts you didn't observe, right? So this is just a simple example. Let's say uh, that the solid edges are unblocked and the dashed edges are unknown. Then these two maps agree. I mean, they're very simple maps, but because you know they have the same unblocked edges and in the second map where the edge from two to three is unblocked and the edge from one to three is unblocked, that doesn't, that we would say agrees with this left map where they were unknown. On the bottom example though, these two maps disagree because in the left map, this edge from one to two is unblocked. In the right map, it's missing. That means it's blocked. And so those two you can actually conclude are different environments. And so basically what we want to do to try and like avoid storing too many maps as we're as we keep executing this environment is when we get maps that agree with one another to try and merge them to get a you know a more consistent understanding of the environment. And so when we merge them we call these merged maps super maps because basically they were obtained by merging the information of two different executions in the environment. And so let me show you um an example, it's a little bit, there's a, kind of a lot going on in the video, so it's a little hard to follow, but but maybe uh, you have this environment, you're trying to travel from the green square at the bottom up to the red square at the top. Um, and then there's all these like different obstacles. So what the robot knows is the black. And then the other obstacles, the robot knows nothing about the, the yellow and gray hashed areas and all the gray areas. And Internally, we have a model of how they're all related to each other, right? Like if, if one of them is blocked, then it's more likely that another one is and things like that. Um, the particulars of that, it's too hard to follow in, in like two minutes, but, uh, but there are these just uh, probabilities on how all these different uh, regions are related to one another. But basically the, the robot just starts executing in this graph. Or in this environment. So in the first task, it tries to travel. All it, ha it has no prior information available other than the base map. So it tries to travel in the uh, using a reactive algorithm. And if you look here, so this is the base map that it had available to it. This is the map that it, it obtained on its first execution. So it, it observed all the white stuff and the gray parts it just didn't get to observe. And it keeps going. Here it switched to a reactive algorithm again. It tried to follow a policy it created with just those two environments, but it didn't work. Again, this, this is a terrible execution. It's just wandering everywhere in the environment, right? Trying to understand how to get to the goal. Um, this time it's still following the policy, right? It says on the bottom. And it actually was able to follow the policy all the way to the goal. And so it didn't uh, have to generate a new map in that case. That time it called the reactive algorithm. You can see that the underlying map is different each time, right? Because different obstacles are present and missing. But what starts to happen over time is that the robot starts calling the reactive policy or the reactive algorithm less and less and can rely on its policy to navigate to the goal more and more. So even though it's on 13 tasks, it's only generated five different, what we call super maps of the environment, now six. Um, and in general, its paths are getting shorter as it's executing more often. So the last step is, of course, so what I showed there, of course, is still in kind of a grid-based environment. And the question is, how do we transition this to real-world environments? One thing is that doing this kind of like matching of maps on like an occupancy grid level is not really a good idea because due to the, the uncertainty that you get from the sensors, deciding if two maps agree is, is difficult, right? There's noise and like alignment issues in the maps. And if you were to just like lay them on top of one another, you're always going to get some like pixels that differ, even if the two maps were taken from the same environment. So instead we consider a hierarchical de decomposition of the graph 
or of the environment into what we call like a navigation graph. And so that's shown on the right hand side here, where we take the environment and we partition it into convex regions. And we think of running our policy to navigate us between those regions. So this, like the graph on which you're running this uh, learned reactive planning problem on is just this one uh, over these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever, eight different regions with edges connecting regions that can be where you can transition from one to the other. And then to navigate within a region, you can then just use a standard kind of local planner. So this means that we can then kind of interface the like what we call the LAMP framework, the learned reactive or learning emotion policy framework with standard navigation stack in, in ROS or, or whatever, where basically the you have you get this base map, you decompose it into these regions that defines a navigation graph. Your high level planner plans kind of how you move within this navigation graph. And then you use the navigation stack to plan within the particular um, each region in that navigation graph. So um, the, another advantage of this is that we can kind of differentiate between uh, changes in the environment where like it actually changes the traversability patterns versus just like pieces of like small obstacles that are present in the environment. So these blue obstacles, they don't actually change the way that the robot operates because they don't fundamentally change the connectivity of the navigation graph. Um, we could compare this to the existing methods that, that are out there in terms of plan, uh, you know, learning uh, emotion policy over time, and we get significant improvements in performance. So these green lines are, are kind of our policy. This is over the number of tasks. So you do get improvement as you execute more and more tasks in the environment, as you, as you might expect. Um, maybe I'll show you just one more video. So this is an example now of, of um, a clear path jackal robot operating in an environment, a uh, sped up a fair bit, but where it's now trying to get from a start up in this top right down to a goal down in the bottom right. And again, the different environments are different, but now it's using this kind of hierarchical decomposition of the environment into like a navigation graph and um, and then using a local planner to navigate in each cell in that navigation graph. Okay, um, maybe I'll just, I'll skip ahead. And then we've also implemented this on uh, on a real robot, like that's the same ClearPath Jackal robot with a, a Velodyne LiDAR on top in, in like an environment like this. This is in the Engineering 7 building here on campus where we kind of construct these environments. Um, and maybe I, I will skip that and we will, I, I'll just kind of summarize this, this idea. So basically what we've been, what we're trying to do is learn something about the correlations in the environment. So as an example, if, if, if there's a lot of activity in one area of the environment and the robot shouldn't traverse through it, then it's more likely that another area has no activity or that another area also has activity. You know, you can learn different things about the environment through repeated executions. And with that, you can potentially improve the performance of the robot over time. Um, one nice thing in this lamp is that no, no prior information is required. All you need is a base map of the environment, which you can get from like a floor plan or something like that, and a start and a goal, and, and off you can go. Um, we've also been applying this same kind of idea to local local planners for autonomous driving. So here the idea is is a little bit different, but it has a lot of the same characteristics. So you have like a, a vehicle and it's trying to perform a maneuver. And so it has like a reference path, like the center line of the road. But there are some occlusions in its in its vision. So these are some parked cars and it's trying to make this turn. And and so the question now is like, can I deviate from my nominal path a little bit? In doing so, I kind of, I like hurt my tracking performance of my nominal path, but I might gain information about what's around this corner, this blind corner that I'm turning. And in doing that, you know, improve my performance on the remainder of my path, you know, be able to drive it more quickly or 
uh, you know, improve my like breaking distance, something like this. And so you kind of have this same trade-off where you're trying to uh, gain information about, in this case, occluded regions in the environment rather than uncertain areas of the environment. Um, and you're trading that off with like how well you're tracking the center line of your lane in on the roadway. Okay, so that's a kind of a, a quick uh, tour through through this this first part and learning um, motion policies over time. The second part if, is is a bit of a transition where instead we're trying to learn user preferences. Uh, so let me just tell you a bit, I'll give you some motivation on this. So. The question that we're basically asking is like, how should an autonomous robot behave? And as I mentioned earlier, users have different preferences on this, and they often have difficulty expressing those preferences. And so by learning user preferences, we can adapt robot behaviors to particular users or particular environments, particular applications, and we can refine behavior via repeated interactions. So here's an example of the difficulties that people have in specifying uh, user behaviors. So this is an example. This was done in collaboration with an industrial partner where they basically have an interface where a person can specify like road rules to robots uh, operating in a factory or warehouse type environment. And so the things they can draw are these green roads which either have an arrow just pointing in one direction, that means it's like a one-way road, or two-way roads. Uh, the, the red areas are no-go zones, and the gray er or yellow areas are slow zones. And so we, could, we asked people to specify these constraints. You, you tell them something about the scenario of the, what the robot, you know, what the factory is doing, what these different regions correspond to, and they draw a layout for how the robot should operate kind of akin to the way there are like typically for forklifts operating in uh, a factory, there are sort of areas that are designated for forklift travel and areas where they don't go. And so this is, this is an example of something that a user drew. To, and then we show them, okay, here's what you drew and here's a start, here's a goal, and here's what the robot would do if they followed your rules. And then on the right-hand side, we say, Here's an alternate behavior where we, where we violate one of your rules. Which one do you prefer? So in the right one, you can see the thing we're violating is in getting from the start to the goal, we're traveling the wrong way on the one-way road that they drew. I don't know why they drew a one-way road going up, but that's what they specified. And then we show them this alternative, which is significantly shorter, and say, which do you prefer? And, and oftentimes, the user will prefer the modified behavior that actually violates some of the constraints that they drew. The reason being that they had a lot of trouble understanding what the impact of what they were drawing was on the robot performance in the first place. So in interactive learning, what we, what we do is we get some prior instructions. That could be that, bait, that like map of, uh, of road rules for the robot. We show this to the robot. We then generate a possible behavior or two possible beha behaviors. We show them to the human. We get some feedback from the human, which could be a choice, like I like A more than I like B. And then based on that, we update the way that the robot's going to behave. So a little bit more specifically, in the active learning framework, if you're given a particular path or trajectory for the robot, there's a, we assume that there's some set of features, which are functions that operate on the path that output a score. You know, they could be like the, the time of the path might have something to do with. So in this particular example on the right, um, we're controlling the orange vehicle and the white vehicle is part of the like simulation and it's performing a lane change. And the thing we're trying to learn is how should the orange vehicle react to this lane change by the, the white vehicle? And so some features in this could be, you know, uh, the path, the length of this path, the distance from the white vehicle, uh, different, you know, different aspects of this particular scenario. And, and different users, you could think of if there's an actual person sitting inside this orange vehicle, uh, they might have different weights on these features. And we assume that the overall way that they evaluate a path is a weighted sum of the different feature costs. And so these weights, W1 through WD, are 
hidden user weights. And that's the main thing that we're trying to learn through interaction. So learn the user weights to then find the optimal path. And so the, the way this problem is typically formulated is that you're given a robot planning problem, some hidden user weights, and a budget of how many times you can interact with the user. And you want to find a path that minimizes the gap from optimal. So the, the score that the user would assign to the path you found versus the score they would assign to the optimal path, the difference or the ratio of that is minimized. So if you think about what happens when you're doing learning in this, there's actually quite a lot of structure. So the first, the main, I guess, mechanism we've been looking at is learning from preference feedback. So what we do is we present the user with two paths, call them P and Q. And then the user tells us which one they prefer. They just say, I prefer P or I prefer Q. And from that feedback, we get an inequality. Like if you go back to here, right, the, the objective function is this weighted sum of features. We calculated the path so we can calculate the feature costs on the different, uh, on the two different paths. And now we just don't know these weights. But we know now from the feedback that the weights satisfy some linear inequality. And so each time we get, you can think of this weight space, which will be like a d-dimensional space. Each time we get a user feedback, we get a hyperplane in that space. That's a, kind of like a cut. And we know that the optimal, like the user weight is on one side of that cut. And so when we get a sequence of feedbacks, it defines like a feasible set in this weight space, which is shown in like in a 2D weight space. It's shown by this green, you know, area for three feedbacks. So we found out that, you know, path one was better than path two. Uh, path three was better than, uh, sorry, P3 was better than Q3 and P2 was, uh, had, was less than or equal to Q2. And so you find out that you lie in this region and that defines a feasible set of weights. And then we can, and this is a convex set. And so we can try and do some kind of optimization for finding the next path to, to present to the user. So this feasible set is convex. Um, and so basically the, 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 the core part of this problem boils down to like, which pair of paths should I show next so that I can best determine what the user weight is, or like, you know, you could think of it in different ways. And maybe I sh shrink the set of feasible weights as much as possible. This is the idea of volume removal. Um, we had this idea of what's called equivalence regions, which is like find another path, find another weight that is sure to lead to a different optimal path. Um, there's an idea of information entropy, which is when you have a uh, uh, users that have some probabilistic uh, feedback. And then we also have this idea of what we call maximum regret, which I'll talk to you a little bit about now. So first, I guess, with equivalence regions. So we two weights. One thing that's interesting, right, is it, it's kind of like there are many weights, user weights, that lead to the same optimal path. There's kind of this sensitivity thing. So if you think of this weight space, it actually gets partitioned into different regions where every right weight within that region leads to the same optimal path. So in this particular example, this is showing that there's four different optimal paths for this, like some simple toy example. And so for each query, we, what we basically want to do is sample weights until we find a new equivalence region. Then we found like a different path and we're sure when we show a comparison to the user, we're guaranteed to at least show them two different paths to compare. Um, we, we use this uh, equivalence region idea to perform a user study. So it, it was like an industrial facility map that looked something like this. There's multiple start and goal locations, and the user's goal is to define some traffic rules, which can be you know, roads, areas of avoidance, speed limits. Um, and so 
we basically have a you know a, a user interface where a person can specify these different road like these different rules on the map. Um, they, so they have this specification process. This gives us an initial specification, and then we go through a learning process where basically we show them a pairs of behaviors: one that follows their specification, one that kind of violates it in some way, and we just ask them which do you prefer, A or B. They give us feedback, and then we present them with another query. And we get to do this a fixed number of times, 10 times or something like that. And at the end, we find out, you know, what's the new kind of specification that we have, the final specification. And the thing that we found is that um, users generally accepted violations of the, the, the specification that they drew. Um, as we went through this learning process, the specifications became similar, more similar between different users. So we were kind of converging to something that seemed to best represent what how a robot should actually operate in the environment. And inexperienced users would benefit more from this learning procedure than experienced users. So we had kind of two sets of users, ones that had used this kind of system before and ones that had not. And so this is kind of showing in terms of the robot performance, what their what the robot performance, maybe if we just look at the novice case, this is what the distribution of robot performance was among the different users after they did their specification. And this is what it's like after we do learning, like after we kind of present them with alternatives and ask them if they prefer them or not. And so we kind of, in, in some sense, we improve their specification, certainly in terms of robot performance, while they still accepted all the modifications. So presume, I mean, it seems that likely that they like the final specification better than the initial specification in some sense. Okay. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk to you about quickly is this idea of regret maximization, because I think it's kind of a, just an interesting concept. So if you have two user weights, let's say, um, I'll call them weight P and weight Q. So weight P, its corresponding optimal path is P, and weight Q, its corresponding optimal path is Q. And so then we can talk about the regret of that pair of weights, which is basically how well, and, and this is not a, a symmetric function, like the, the order of the arguments matters. So what P weight of P with respect to Q means is that we say, what's the cost of path P? If the users op if the users' weights were Q versus the optimal path when the with the user weights of Q. So it's basically like how bad is P if the optimal weights were Q? Since it's not symmetric, we can also consider the alternative, right? Where we swap the arguments, which is how bad would Q be if the optimal weights were P? And if we add these two things, we can we call this the symmetric regret. Um, and then what we can try to do when we're generating a set of queries is generate ones that maximize the symmetric regret. Uh, and so basically we search over pairs of paths and try to find a pair whose course, like that, where if, if one of them was the optimal for the user, the other one would be particularly disliked and vice versa. You know, they're kind of like in some sense, maximally different paths because we feel we could get informative feedback from presenting that pair. And so in the case where we have like a probability distribution over the weight set, because maybe the users are, are probabilistic, like they, they might answer incorrectly with some probability, then we also weight this by you know, the corresponding probabilities of those weights being the user weight, given the feedback that we've received so far. So this is kind of the a, a method for generating queries. Um, and we've used this to in this, this is the called the driver experiment, but where, as I mentioned, the white car is doing a lane change. Um, this is for a particular user, what an optimal behavior might look like the response of the orange vehicle. And this is some like learning iterations where we show some paths. I mean, some are terrible, right? Like this is one path that this would be a response to the to the lane changes, like drive off the road into the grass. That's probably not a good one, but you know, you present this like two alternate paths and you ask the user which you like better. 
And these are the features that we use as, as scoring the pass. So like the heading, lane keeping, distance to the white car, vehicle speed, lateral motion, angular acceleration, and what's the minimum speed? Like how much braking essentially do you do along this path? And through a set of you know, only 10 interactions or something like that, we can learn a good response um, that, that's kind of tailored to the particular user. Okay. And the last thing I won't, I won't talk much about is we've been extending this to the case of learning from scale feedback, where rather than just saying, I prefer A versus B, like, like I like A better than B, you can give like a weight on how much more you like it. So this is like a slider showing, like, I strongly prefer this path on the right, or I strongly prefer this path on the left, or I think they're about equal. And it's kind of an interesting thing. On the one hand, this is more expressive. And we do find that people, we can actually learn more quickly when we give this kind of more fine-grained feedback. However, it seems like users might not like this kind of feedback as much. The simplicity of just the like pairwise preference, just do you like A better than B? There's, there's some like kind of something nice about that, that I think people tend to just like, even though we might be able to learn more from this. Maybe it's kind of like in uh, in rating systems you see on like Netflix or on YouTube or things like that. Like it used to be you would rate out of five stars, right? And now you just give like thumbs up or thumbs down. It's like this kind of binary feedback. I think there's something appealing about it. Um, so anyway, um, just to wrap up, I, I guess we've we've covered two things. One is this learning to navigate. And so how do I improve performance over repeated executions? And the other is learning user preferences. So how do I learn these softer aspects? Like how much space should I give to a person? How much, um, how fast should I be traveling around people? Things like that, where, where we can tailor the, the robot behavior to a particular user in the way that they would like it to operate. Um, so I guess last, this is, you know, work with a bunch of uh, my students. So the first part of the work was, Primarily, uh, Florence and Ryan were the, the people that led that. Then Armin Sedeghi was the postdoc kind of working on this. And Tristan as well got involved in the second stage of, of it and, and, and was working on, on this. Most of these people have now graduated and are, are working. Uh, in terms of learning user preferences, Nils was a PhD and postdoc with me, and now he's a postdoc at Delft. Um, and then it was also collaboration with Dana Kulich, who, who was at Waterloo and has moved to Monash. And then that, that work about learning with scale feedback was a collaboration with uh, Dorsa Sadig and Erdem at Stanford. And so uh, thanks to all the collaborators for that. Um, thanks for everyone for listening and um, be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Stephen, for the great talk. Uh, let's open the stage for questions. You can either ask directly or write in the chat and I will repeat them. So it's up to you. Uh, thanks, Steve. You know, very, very interesting talk. You know, uh, we enjoyed all the, all the pieces actually. Uh, oh. which is kind of rare, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, you know, people present like one piece is very interesting and then some other feeling, yeah. like but uh, this was not the case. Um, yeah, thanks. So, the, uh, you know, the, the, the problem that you, that you talk about, you know, the, the, where you have like a several different environments and uh, you're trying to discover which one you're in. That really reminded me one of the things that I was doing very early on in my career. You know, you just like threw me back like 30 years. Um, okay. Um, I don't think that I ever published anything on it, but I was thinking of these problems as a, some kind of like a diagnostic, you know, like you're doing, like a diagnosing which environment you're in, right? Or, you know, diagnosing what is the fault in the environment where the fault is, where the obstacle is, right? Um, I see, yeah. Um, and, you know, some of the, the same things, you know, like, uh, like, um, um, appear there now, um, the problem is that, so the complexity scales with the number of, of different environments, right? But if you're thinking of like a, like doors that are open or closed, right? So then the, uh, the number of potential environment is now is exponentially the number of doors, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, which is one of the things that appear in these kind of uh, problems, right? So is that something that you manage or? Um... 
I think, yeah, you know, you're, you're exactly right. So like in that first case where we basically enumerate all of the right. environments, mm -hmm. then it does scale with the number of environments. And like right, you right, said, right. the number of environments can become incredibly large. Um, in the second one, we don't actually, this is this whole idea of like mm -hmm. merging maps where it's like, right. it's in some sense, like we're trying to capture this idea that like, if the same path worked in two environments, then uh -huh. you shouldn't really need to distinguish between them it, it, to some extent, you know, like, like if locally the same thing is working in them, then like kind of try and drown out or like ignore everything around it. Um, and so this is this idea of kind of like trying to merge agreeing maps in some sense. To, it's an attempt to deal with this complexity, but it is inherently there. Like you say, mm -hmm. I mean, it blows up combinatorially, right? As, oh, okay. But, but, but you can, uh, you, so now you're just uh, defining classes where essentially solutions look pretty much the same and then you exactly. to separate them, right? So essentially if a door that I'm not intending to use is open or closed, doesn't matter to me. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Very cool. Um, thanks. Um, you know, the, the other part um, um, on the learning, the user uh, preferences. Yeah. I like the maximum regret thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, you typically you're trying to do the opposite, right? But uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so essentially, you're maximally separating things. Um, yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that we have been working on is the case where the user preferences are actually incomparable in a sense, right? So, um, uh, you know, for example, collision is much worse than running a red light, right? So, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and there is no way that, or, you know, like a violating a lane constraint, you know, to make it more reasonable. Um, and there is no amount of say, yeah, okay, but, you know, I, I'm okay with colliding a little bit, right? <laughs> if I yeah, can violate yeah. the, the lane by a lot, right? Um, uh, have, have you considered these kind of things and sort of something that really cannot be expressed as a, as a linear combination of weights? Not really. I mean, so I, I, we've definitely been thinking about this a bit. And actually at like at Wafer this year, we have a paper where we're just trying to look more at like the Pareto optimal front in mm -hmm. some sense. So not necessarily scalarizing, right? But you just have a set of objective functions and you're trying to understand something about the relative, mm -hmm. you know, is one basically, yeah, is like one point dominating another or are they kind of equivalent in some sense in, in the Pareto sense, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think that's a complete answer to, to what you're asking. Um, I mean, I guess if... If there are things that are truly hard constraints, like a collision, then maybe it just doesn't go in the in the scalarized but kind of. Sometimes, but sometimes you collide, right? Or, or, or you know, or, um, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm asking about this because you know this is one of the things that we've really been thinking um, a lot about, uh, both in the academic work and also clearly in the work with the company, as you can imagine. Yeah, yeah. I'm not completely satisfied that we we we, we had the answer. So I, okay. Uh, I don't know, but I don't know. I think that you know some of this work was uh, when when you were around. Did you remember the the work we're doing on minimum violation planning? Have you yeah, heard? yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly, I remember. Like Marco was also doing some work on this. I think right. Or more set. Or maybe more chance constraint. Than, uh, um, Oh, Yana. Oh, yeah, you remember Yana? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right, right. Anyway. Um, yeah. Just, just a, but in, in a sense, it's a different way of setting the order between preferences, right? And then, of course, all the, all the, um, your consideration about learning and, you know, getting user feedback, those apply. Uh, just wondering how the way that you separate things would apply in the case when you have this kind of, uh, what we think of these less geographical preferences, rather okay. than uh, just the flat uh, converse combination of weights. But, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, maybe you can talk about that. So it's no, it's interesting. Facts. Yeah, I've actually. There's also this. Um, maybe, maybe it's kind of related to like when you go from these like Pareto, Pareto optimal kind of expressions to like 
how do you say it? Like scalarization is not Pareto complete, I think is what right, they say. Right, 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 right. So there, there are points on the Pareto front that are not optimal for any scalarization of the, <laughs> oh, I see. like any set of weights. <laughs> But there are other objectives, like the max of all the features, I think, that are Pareto complete, okay. um, which is kind of not intuitive. But anyway, it's like we've been looking a little bit into this recently, just like oh, trying. I think it's somewhat related, but yeah, it might be interesting to talk okay. sometime. Okay, cool. You know, you know, for, for me, the, the thing is that I, I understand that, you know, there is this idea of trying to learn the user preferences. However, what I'm wondering is, are the user preferences really express or expressible as a linear combination of weights or even you know as a lexicographic ordering of of linear combinations of weights or do right. we need to look for something else you know is is our model in a sense correct rich enough to capture the user preferences or not i don't think that we we have the right model probably yeah yeah no, I think you're probably right that like, I mean, you, you partially make this scalarization kind of weighted some out of convenience, right? I mean, it makes yeah, right because you know, that, that, that's one reasonable thing to do, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I don't think that we had the right model for that yet. Uh, you know, I struggle yeah. with this. I've been struggling with this for the past 10 years. So Okay, yeah, very know. interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you know, I, I know. I, as usual, I'm hogging all the speaker time. I don't know if people have other questions. <laughs> Any other question? Actually, let me just throw in all, all of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Joel. <laughs> Maybe I have a, a small one, which was a bit quick for me to understand. Uh, I think it was on slide 27 when we were, you were showing this, uh, these different policies uh, oh, being, yeah. uh, being changed uh, when, when you was, uh, when you were- uh, This video know, or? Were, yeah, exactly. In the video, you were showing different policies and you were showing how going from one to the other, you, you kept learning or kept somehow keeping track of things you you have seen along the way right yeah and my question yeah. my question was do you have uh, some results on convergence for these kind of things because i can imagine that depending on the model you have for for the way the obstacles could could change their position you might end up in situations in which you simply jump from one scenario to the other without converging right we we can guarantee we get to the goal we can't guarantee that we like this, this like merging idea comes with some. So maybe just like to, to quickly, like the, the idea is like sort of, let's take this point, you know, these maps listed here, this is sort of like the world to the robot. Like it, as, it, as far as it knows, this is the only ways the environment could appear where the white stuff is what it's observed in the gray, anything could be happening in the gray. It just doesn't know, right? And so now it's executing this environment where it's sort of generated a policy based on just these five maps. Either it works and it gets to the goal, or it gets to a point where none of its observation or like it, its set of observations don't match, don't agree with any of these environments. And then it switches to a reactive policy. Like it can be uh, like an A star light or, uh, or I don't know, some kind of replanning A star type type planner that's guaranteed to get you to the goal, but might waste a fair bit of time. And so that that's kind of all that's happening. Like you'll, you'll keep following the policy to the point that like you conclude that I can't be in any of these environments. And so like none of the action it's recommending isn't feasible. And then you'll just switch to the reactive planner, which will get you there in a sort of slower way. Okay, I see, I see. I wasn't clear yeah. about the second part. This, this, uh, the question came because I, I thought that there was only the first part. Okay, good. Yeah, that makes total yeah. sense now. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so th I, the only thing we can really show is like our reliance on the reactive planner reduces over time, right? We start to just be able to, our policy gets richer and we start to be able to use it uh, more. And so that's what kind of is happening later in the simulation where, you know, we're, we've executed the path 13 times, but only have five different maps. Um, I see, I see. Yeah. Thank you. 
Uh, actually, there is a question in the chat from Arsh uh, Rajkamal, which asks, uh, are you planning to do an experimental study for the user preferences part? We, we have done one user study already. Um, we've actually, we've done two user studies. That's, so like we've done, like this data here is from a real user study. Um, and so that's one thing I, I mean, I was going to say to, to Emilio's question is like, I agree we don't have the, our model for the user isn't perfect, but at least it's good enough to like improve performance. Like, you know, we're probably leaving something on the table, but, but we are able to, improve specifications that users provide. Or, I mean, in this second one here, th there's also a user study corresponding to this setup here where we're kind of doing this pick up, pick up an object and bring it to the other side of the table for like a kind of robotic waiter type example. Um, so we're hoping to do one more user study where we, where we do this maximum regret in a kind of a, uh, a complex, I think it's like a grocery store kind of scenario, but uh, we have some data, but we don't have everything yet at this point. All right, thank you very much. I think uh, it's time to thank you again for, for your talk. Uh, and we, I wish you good luck for all the next steps. All right. Um, yeah, I will well, follow thank up you with the much. video once, it, once it's edited. Okay. And uh, thank you all for participating and uh, see you all to the next episode of Autonomy Talks next week. All right. Hey, Steve, thanks a lot. Bye-bye.